Hey guys, Callisto here. Um, back with another overlay programming tutorial. Um, I know I'd gotten some messages that the one I had made before on how to make scoreboards for fighting games, uh, the documentation I had had put up as a sample in uh, Google Drive had gone away. Uh, I accidentally deleted it off my real computer, uh, so I no longer had access to that. Uh, I wasn't able to replace it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it's been about a year, a year and a half since I made that video. Since then, uh, I've gotten to do overlays for several tournaments. I did them for Frosty Fostings, uh, did them for CEO, Combo Breaker, uh, the Capcom Monster Hunter World Championships. Uh, and in the meantime, I've learned a bunch of tricks. Um, I actually write the overlays in a really different method than I did when I made that video. And I figured... Uh, it probably would be better to just show people what I actually do now instead of just re finding and re-uploading outdated information. Uh, so if you're not sure what I'm referring to, uh, I'm talking about the animated scoreboards that you would see at the top of a fighting game match where you have your score, uh, your names, uh, your logos, uh, and... Ideally, there's a handful of things that I would like this to do that over the kind of last year, I've learned how to make it do what I want a bit more. Uh, so the main goals I have here, uh, the big thing is I want it to have kind of clean animation so you can do this yourself, but your local streams, your regionals, your monthlies, whatever, will just kind of have a more produced feel for them, uh, which kind of helps draw viewers without adding, you know, exponentially more cost to the event, uh, which is always the challenge. Uh, another goal is I want to be able to swap the art assets in and out pretty easily so that, uh, you know, if it's time for a new event or if you decide to recolor your locals, whatnot, you can just kind of pop in different assets without rewriting a whole boatload of code. Um, couple personal things that I prefer. Uh, I had shown on the last one, I usually make the team names a different color than the player names, just so they pop out a little bit. Uh, I also added some stuff so that if the name is too long, it'll automatically resize the player's name so that it doesn't kind of overflow the div in a weird way. Uh, it will rotate logos. Uh, if you have, you know, maybe a sponsor or an event logo plus the channel logo and you want to have them in a rotation. Um, and the important part of that is you just have to kind of add and remove logos from the HTML and the code will adjust itself automatically. And lastly, the important automatic adjustment is instead of making a scoreboard for every single game, like for Frosty Fossing, say, I had to make a different scoreboard.html for about 32 games. Uh, the idea behind this one is to have something that you can set up some things in advance and then just pick a drop down from stream control and it'll adjust for the game automatically. So I did a couple practice runs of this. Hopefully I can get this done in a little under two hours if I don't meander too much. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. The first thing we're gonna do is make ourselves kind of an organized workspace here. So we're gonna make some folders. This is how I would lay out an overlay package if I was doing it for an event to send off for a client. So you're gonna have a folder for your actual overlays. Uh, the underscore there is just so that it always kind of jumps to the top so that it's easy to find. Uh, you need one to host your static images. You need one to hold your WebMs, which I'll be going over in a few. One to hold your JavaScript. I'm gonna call this one Adobe, and this is basically just to host your PSDs, your After Effects files. Uh, that is probably gonna be the biggest change from the last tutorial I did is I have moved over to using Creative Cloud. Um, it's, especially if you can find somebody to split a license with, um, it's not too bad per month and it's something that I use almost every day at this point. So uh, if this is the type of stuff you wanna be doing more, I do think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, 
kind of along those lines, I will be showing most of this being an X split, but I will show at the end that these overlays will work exactly the same in OBS. Um, I've had an X split premium license since it was in beta, so I haven't really had a reason to change, but um, there's also no particular reason to not use OBS Studio that I know of, so uh, these overlays should work in both. So let's go ahead and grab the things we need to download. Uh, I'll have links for all of this stuff up in the YouTube version a little bit later on. So the first thing we're going to do is grab Stream Control, which you're going to download the current version, the point three. Now Stream Control is just a UI that spits out a JSON for the overlays to read from. So we're going to download that there. We're also going to grab the beta for the actual little application UI, which has some fixes. We're going to grab TweenMax from Greensock. It is a JavaScript library that will handle the animating of the text when we need to move it around. So we'll dump that into our JS folder. Grab jQuery. Uh, jQuery is the most optional of any of this. I just prefer it because it makes the amount of physical typing you have to do a little bit less. So you, if you're more comfortable with just regular JavaScript, I know some people don't like to rely on libraries where they don't need to. Uh, it is totally optional. That's going to live in our JS folder as well. Oh, whoops. Actually, I'll grab the minified version since we don't need the uncompressed one. Um, this font is just, I was looking for a plain readable font. Uh, so it's called Dean's Gay. I'll link it. It's just for the use of the example. Nothing particularly special about it. Um, and then this I'll show off a little bit later. This is a plugin I already have installed, but it's basically to allow Premiere to export directly to WebM, which uh, normally uh, Adobe products cannot do. Uh, so I'll show that a little bit later. So let's get back to our folder. Extract this here. Make a folder for our fonts. Extract our stream control. Just going to shorten that up a little. That way, so th the reason I'm shortening that to SC is so that there's less to type when you need to reference that path later in the overlays. Uh, and then extract the beta version of the application. And we'll just dump that in the folder and replace the old one. So now, extract our green sock. That will just live in the JS folder here. And I believe that's it for now. So uh, the first step we will do is uh, make the actual graphical assets. Uh, now, I am not a graphic design person, so I'm going to do this. Uh, they're going to be super basic. Um, and I'm going to try to just knock it down quickly so we don't spend too much time on it. Um, let's see here. I have a folder of game. Re I also have this uploaded to my drive, which I'll link on the YouTube version. Uh, basically, it is just a collection of screenshots, uh, 1920 by 1080, of various games. I'll try to add to it as I get more. Uh, these are just the ones that I had on hand. Uh, just so that when you're making the actual graphical part, it's easy to kind of check how things line up. So we're going to actually start with Street Fighter. Um, because the positioning of the Street Fighter V health bars is actually kind of right medium compared to a lot of games. Uh, so there's three different types of games we'll need to worry about. Uh, ones where the health bars are right around where they are in Street Fighter V. Uh, ones where they are closer to the top of the screen and they give you a little bit less room to work with. And then ones where uh, they're a bit lower uh, 
that's for me personal, mostly Street Fighter 4. Although if you were going to do something for, say, an NRS game, you probably would want to have your names and scores a little bit lower. I'm not going to show those today because they require a little bit more massaging than uh, other games. But let's go ahead and draw up a couple quick name bars and score bars. So we're going to use our pen tool. Make this black for now. All right, so the pen tool in Photoshop just kind of quickly lets you draw corners of a shape and it'll make the shape around it. So uh, I usually, in Photoshop here, I turn on the rulers to pixels, which makes it a bit easier to kind of know where I'm positioning stuff. So we'll do it about here. Gonna make it um, about 380-ish pixels across, something like that. Um, I forget the actual measurement I was doing, but healthy amount of space to put names. But you don't need to make it the entire length of this span because, as I mentioned, we'll be adding something to kind of resize the names automatically if they run a little long. So you don't have to worry about giving like a massive amount of uh, of space. Uh, normally I actually have grid lines shown here too, but they're not showing up today for some reason. All right. Let's put this corner up here. Make a little bit of kind of an angled edge there. And then we'll bring it back and close it over here. So we have ourselves a little name bar here. And we'll make one little pip for the score. Gonna change this to be a different color. Now we have our, let's actually set that one a little cleaner. Oh, it's that first one that I had like. This is why I like having the grid lines. Bear with me, I am terrible at Photoshop. This is the part that I knew would take like obnoxiously long. All right. Because of course, Photoshop lets you draw in fractions of a pixel, which is not something you should let somebody like me do.
OK. So we have a spot for our names, spots for our scores. Uh, what we can do real quick is just group these up, duplicate them. Flip them horizontally, and then move them to this side of the screen. Okay, let's just add a quick little outline and drop shadow to them as well so they stand out from the game a little bit. So we'll kind of do them in opposite colors, the black ones. I will do the outline in the color of the gray and vice versa. Okay, that's done. Let's just double check the positioning of the ones on the right side. You can see here this little edge, the gray part, comes to about 821. So it's about 139 pixels from center on a 1920. That would be 960 pixels would be the center. So 139 from the other side would be 1099. All right, so we're just a couple pixels off. Just going to group those two. One more. Now the edge is at 1099. Okay, so they're symmetric. Let's make a another quick spot for uh, the up top just to show kind of what round it is. Okay, so we're gonna put it around 840 there, which is 120 from center. So on the other side, We'll also put it another 120 from center, so that'll be around 1080. Right about here. All right, put a little bit of an angle. We're going to make this about 36 pixels. Oh, by the way, I, I, I should have mentioned um, I am making this for 1080 resolution. Um, however, you'll notice this stream right now is in 720. Um, that's because I usually stream in 720, but I local record in 1080 uh, so that you have higher quality stuff for YouTube later, uh, but still have a manageable stream to view, something you can do a nice slow encoding on on my machine. Uh, so I would recommend always build your overlays for 1080. Um, let the streaming application scale them down as needed, uh, but they'll look jankier if you try to scale them up from a lower resolution than if they get scaled down. All right, so that one's done. Let's add an outline to that. And a little bit of drop shadow. The drop shadow is kind of important to me because it's that just little bit of difference visually between a overlay looking like it's sitting on top of the gameplay and it just kind of being flat against the background. So again, I'm not a graphic design person, but that is something I would recommend. So 
let's just have a look how this compares to other games real quick. Keeping in mind this is based on Street Fighter V. So we'll throw Tekken 7 in here. Drag that down underneath everything. You see it fits Tekken pretty well here too. Um, we'll do Blaze Blue Tag. Fits those health bars pretty well. But when we start getting into some other games that uh, have higher health bars, you'll notice that they're going to need to come up a little. We'll actually handle that change in After Effects rather than in Photoshop. Uh, and then for the one true game, you'll notice that they'll actually have to come down a little bit. Uh, that would also be the case in NRS games. You would need to also drag it down a little bit. And like I mentioned, you need to find something else to do here so that you're not covering the timer. Uh, so that is one that we'll deal with later. The important thing is to make sure that you have the important game elements not covered. The timer isn't covered, the health bars aren't covered, the character names are, you know, is some of them, if they run long in certain spots, they can be covered a little as long as the portraits are shown, and most importantly, you're not covering any important meters so that the audience can tell what resources are available to the players. So. Let's go ahead and export these. We're going to export each component individually. Uh, but first, we're actually going to get rid of some of this empty space. Because when you have, even though it's transparent and you have this alpha channel here, uh, if you actually render all of your alpha area at higher space, it's still going to you know, add up in terms of file size. It's still technically there. Uh, it's just a transparent color, so we're going to shrink this down a bit to just the size we need to save on file space a little. So we only need about the top 114 pixels to have the scoreboard live in. So we'll do a quick export as PNG. Go to our images folder. This will be the round. So the player two name. So player two score. So we have our static images. So we're going to go ahead and put away Photoshop, bring up After Effects. So we're going to make a new composition. Uh, make sure that the resolution of the composition is the same as the images that you're going to be bringing in, 1920 by 114. We're going to want this to run at 60 frames per second, like our stream. And our duration, we're only going to need about a half a second to a second. You want to keep these videos short, again, to kind of save on file space. And remember that how these are working is essentially the video is going to play, and then it's just going to sit there after it's done. And then it becomes your background to have your names and your scores over. So let's go ahead and start this composition. Go to our images folder and bring these in. So now we got to do some things to get these animated. First things we're going to do is uh, I want this to have an animation where this kind of like sweeps in from the inside. Uh, so it just kind of appears from nowhere coming from the inside. And then the little score pip will come out from under it while the round holder kind of comes down from the top. So first thing we need to do is make a mask, uh, which is essentially a shape that will create some boundaries for when this part is displayed. So we're going to go back to our pen tool. Uh, make sure to click just somewhere in this empty gray area so that you do not have an individual source highlighted, because uh, you want to create the mask as a new source, not as part of a source, which is what it'll try to do if you have one highlighted. 
So go to our pen tool. Uh, for this particular part, um, you want to try to match this angle as closely and flushly as possible. I don't know if there's a way in After Effects to just mask a, uh, you know, like to make an image and then mask to that shape automatically. I don't personally know how to do it, but again, this is not really my forte. So that's going to be one side. Once you have this inside part set correctly, the rest you just need to kind of set bounds around the rest of the name bar here. That part doesn't have to be perfect. So we'll do here, up here, and you see the shape starting to form around here, and close it off there. All right, so we're going to bring this down. Uh, actually, the shape layer needs to just sit above the shape that it is going to be um, masked to, so it can stay there above player one name. So we're going to go to uh, track mat. Um, every now and then, your like when you boot up uh, After Effects, your track mat options won't actually show up. Um, just Google like you know display track mat drop down or something. And I forget what the fix was, but I've had to do it a couple times where my After Effects just didn't have this here, and I had to do something to make it come back. So we're going to alpha mat track this to shape layer one. So you can see that the shape disappeared. But now, if the, uh, if the board kind of goes beyond the bounds of that shape, it d does not display anywhere outside of there. So the nice part about After Effects is when you want to make something symmetric, it's pretty easy. I'll just copy and paste a new one. Go to Layer, Transform, Flip Horizontal. And now we have one on the player two side. Same deal. Okay, so that's set. Now we need to make them for the scores. I'm just going to hide the names real quick just so that we have our clean space to work with here. Uh, these, once you get the same thing, like. On the back end, you want to be relatively close to being flush against it, uh, just to kind of make it cleaner when it comes in. Over here, it doesn't really matter, as long as it constrains the shapes. Whoops, I totally did the thing I was talking about. Uh, because I have P P2 name highlighted here, I actually did not make a new shape with my mask. So I got to click here. Now let's go back and try that again. Oops, a little too far in on that. Now we have a shape for the scores. We're going to bring that down to player score one, and we're going to mask that again. And same deal here. We're going to copy, paste, transform the layer, and flip it horizontally, which is going to put it to the other side near the player two score. Drag that above P2 score. Mask it here. All right, so um, yeah, so Static GX, we will actually, uh, the playing with positioning and opacity is pretty much exactly what we're going to do. The mask is just there to have it um, set a constraint on where it can appear from um, so that it, it kind of just makes it look a little less weird as it comes out. All right, so we're going to do our animations. Uh, first, we'll do the names. This is going to be super basic stuff. Uh, we're going to set keyframe for positioning. Um, we're going to give it about 15 frames to come in. So we'll set another key point here. 
the opacity, we're going to have it become fully opaque a little bit faster, only about 10 frames. Um, set a little bit of easing here. All right. So we're going to move this to a position where uh, it is outside the bounds of the mask, and then it's going to move in to the mask. At the same time, it's going to go from having 0% opacity to having 100%. So it's just going to appear out of nowhere there. So we're going to do the same thing for player 2 name. The only difference here is we need to move it to the left this time, so we're going to have to decrease the position value. Okay, there we go. for the scores. We're going to bring the scores in a little bit later, right when the names finish animating, so right around that 15 frame mark. And because they're shorter, we're only going to give them about 10 frames to come in. Just hide the name for a sec, just to make sure that everything is fully hidden. You'll notice if you don't quite get it put away far enough, a little bit of the drop shadow in the corner there can peek a bit. Okay, let's repeat this on the player 2 score. And I don't really need to play with the opacity on the score pips because they're already hidden underneath the board as they start to come in. Um, so that kind of accomplishes that for us, the, the way it sort of just appears. Okay. So we have our little load-in animation there. Now let's do the round. Give this about 15 frames to come in. And 10 frames to become visible. And we're going to bring um, this up a bit. So we're going to decrease the Y value of the position to kind of bring it off screen up to the top. And then bring it down. So that's it. Now, the nice thing um, about using Creative Crowd, uh, Cloud is that we don't actually need to export this. I used to make WebMs by exporting and then using uh, FFmpeg to convert to WebM. Um, instead, what we're going to do uh, is use this plugin, uh, FNordsware WebM for uh, Premiere. Uh, you download for your various whatever system you're using, and then when you run the installer, you want to run it to your program files folder for your Adobe. So program files, Adobe, common plugins, whatever version it is, media core, 
and then here. So this is where you set when you run the installer for that plugin. Point it to install here, as you can see it right here. And then after you install it, you can relaunch Premiere. So let's get a new project. Start it here, and while I'm thinking of that, let's just go ahead and save our other projects just so we have them. And you were probably, if you were actually into graphic design, you'd probably use Illustrator to draw the uh, base overlays rather than Photoshop. I just have absolutely no idea how to use Illustrator for my life. So I did not want to subject everybody to watching me struggle with that. All right, so we have Premiere open. Now this is where it becomes really nice to be using Creative Cloud. Um, instead of exporting a video, we're just going to take our composition here in After Effects. We're going to click it, going to drag it down to Premiere, going to plop it right there. Take a moment to do its thing. Once it's in there, we'll move it to the timeline. And here you go. Don't worry about that black background there. Um, other things are not necessarily designed to show Alpha Channel the way that uh, After Effects is. But you can see we have our little 30 second video. So we're going to export that as a WebM. So we will go to export. So for our export settings, we're going to call this scoreboard one because we're going to have a few of them. Uh, our width and our height are the same. It matches the source, 60 frames per second. Uh, codec settings, go ahead and bump up the quality. Um, the difference here between VP8 and VP9, uh, HTML5, which we're going to be embedding the WebM into an HTML file, can decode VP9 perfectly fine so that the alpha channel will come through properly. By that, I mean everything underneath the scoreboard will be transparent, so you just have the scoreboard sitting there. However, if you're trying to create a WebM that you want to use as a background or something that you're going to dump directly into XSplit, um, some versions, the newer ones, may do it fine, but uh, some versions cannot decode VP9 properly, so you'll want to actually export as VP8 instead. All right, we're going to include our alpha channel. Um, and then normally you can, you know, bump up the color space and the bit depth. We're using super basic stuff. That's not necessary right now. We're just going to go ahead and export it like that. All right, so now in our WebM folder, we should have this. It's going to look weird when I play it in VLC again because of it being in VP9. Uh, no, I am using, uh, this is actual licensed uh, Creative Cloud. Um, I do split a license with somebody. Uh, I do think that's worth the cost if you're doing this type of work. Um, something I use pretty much every day at this point. Uh, all right. So now we're going to adjust this for the other games where the scoreboard needs to be higher up. So I'm going to grab all these for a second, bring this over to the 25 frame point so we can see everything. And we're just going to move these up a bit. Give just a little bit of breathing room at the top, but still have that about as far up there as we can go. Um, now. Here's the part you want to be careful uh, for. You, you're going to see that we only change that positioning here. So things that have keyframes for positioning is still going to have the original position set. So we're going to need to adjust those keyframes real quick one at a time. Uh, so 
29 pixels is where it should be. Make sure that you click again in some empty space so that you're only working on one at a time. Otherwise, you'll change something somewhere else that you didn't necessarily mean to. All right. Okay. Got two more. Now, everything, the round should be the same, but uh, you can see right there that player two scores a little goof still. So let's double check that, see what I did wrong. There we go. Forgot to change it right there. Okay, let's try that again. So our bars are moved up. Our round is in the same positioning. Everything else is pretty much the same. Now, the nice thing about having this linked to Premiere like that is the changes just carry over automatically. So now here, all we have to do is export again. So this will be scoreboard 2. All right. And we'll make one more, this time for the lowered health bars. Pretty much the same idea. We're just going to bring it down to the bottom this time. Okay. everything where it's supposed to be. Carries over to Premiere. Okay, so now we have our graphical assets. Uh, so let's go ahead and start on the actual coding. So I'm going to make one file. Going to make a JS file to hold our JavaScript when we get to that point. and the actual overlay file. Uh, the reason why I know in my last tutorial I actually did the JavaScript in the same file, uh, that was a very hard lesson I learned during Frosty Fostings, uh, was that when I had a, a separate JavaScript for everything instead of one set based JavaScript file that I referenced, uh, when, it, when I decided, hey, I want these names to come in 100 milliseconds faster than they do now, I had to make that change across 32 different files instead of one. Uh, so one of the big goals that I'm trying to do here today is make it so that when it's time to make changes, you only have to edit one spot of one file. So hopefully we can accomplish that. So let's see. Um, just got our basic HTML tags here. some coffee for a moment. All 
All right, back to it. Now I am going to put, even though I just said we we're keeping our JavaScript in a separate file, there is going to be some JavaScript here, uh, basically just variables that will be stored to carry over to the main JavaScript file. So I'll make some space for that there. All right. First, we're going to include the JavaScript files that we will need. Uh, these two dots here, because of the file structure where this is going to live in overlays, and then you need to go up a level and then down into JS, uh, this dot dot is essentially just the code for saying go up a level, then look for JS scoreboard.js uh, This little bit right here is just telling it to use Unicode characters. I don't believe that's really necessary. It's just kind of how I learned to do it, so I don't think that's a must. We need to include our jQuery. And we're going to need to include, include our uh, TweetMax. So that's going to be buried a couple folders deep. So it's going to be greensock-js source minified tweenmax.min.js Okay, now those are just there for later. We're not going to be using any of the actual JavaScript yet, so we're going to go ahead and comment those out. And then we can start adding our elements first and then go back and handle the CSS. So, first we're going to have our scoreboard background. So we're going to make a wrapper for that. This is going to be the actual WebM that we just created. am I missing here? With okay. All right, uh, until we're ready for that, we're also going to comment that out for now. And instead, we're going to put the still images that we made earlier just as placeholders until we can get our CSS put together uh, to get everything where it's supposed to be. It's going to be in our images folder.
So that is our background of our scoreboard. Now we're going to have the actual scoreboard, which is going to be our text areas. We're going to make a couple wrappers to contain each side in, just so they're easier to move around uh, as groups a little bit later. score here. I'm going to add a class of scores so that it's easier to affect both scores at the same time in the CSS. We're going to make another wrapper, but this time uh, this wrapper is going to be a span. Um, and I'll get to this in a little bit as to why I do it like this. This is going to contain our uh, player team and our name. This way, the two of them sit next to each other, and they'll align properly despite being separate fields. Um, and the whole point of that is, like I said earlier, I like to make the team names a different color than the player names. Uh, so this kind of gives a clean way to do that. Okay, so now we're going to just repeat this same thing for player two. Then we also need to have our round in here. And we'll go ahead and put some placeholder values in all of these. So that's it for our scoreboard. Now we need a spot for logos. Um, I did, just in the interest of saving time, go ahead and make some generic logos ahead of time. So we're going to dump those here. So we have three logos here, and then we're going to make one more little div. And this one, all it's there for is to store the information of what the name of the game that's being drawn from Stream Control. And I'll go into that a little bit later as to why. All right, so now we have all of our elements. Let's go ahead and add some basic CSS. Going to get our font in here. Uh, I forgot the full name of it. Let's see what it is. 
Dean's Day, Dean's Gate condensed dash bulb. All we're doing here is setting uh, basically a nickname for the font so it's easier to reference later. Uh, which is a bigger deal when you have more fonts that you're going to be switching between. So we'll set some CSS for the body. It's going to be 1920 by 1080. We're going to have the overflow hidden. Uh, what this does is make it so that when you throw it into a streaming app, um, it doesn't have like scroll bars or anything in case something overflows it. Okay, we'll have that. Uh, we're going to make sure there's no excess padding or margin. Uh, what else do we want? We want, uh, we're going to transform the text to uppercase letters. We'll have just plain white as the generic uh, overall font color. And let's go ahead and add a little bit of a text shadow to all the font in here too. Same, same reasoning with the actual overlay images. The uh, little bit of drop shadow just kind of helps it pop off of its underlying container a little bit easier. So I'll just kind of go with a dark gray that'll show up on both the black and the gray. All right, is there anything else? I think that's it for, oh wait, hold on the whole thing with the font. There we go. So we go back and reference the font family that we set. All right. So this should, it's going to look like a jumbled mess. But everything should be there, right? All right. So let's go ahead first, get our scoreboards just kind of lined up a little bit better. So we set the class for them. You're going to be using position absolute a lot here. Um, all this does is make it so that you can reference a specific number of pixels uh, from a boundary edge for an object to sit. Whoops. What am I doing? Left, zero pixels. So with position absolute, the positioning is referential to the overall boundary of the body. So I'm saying that I want this to be zero pixels from the left wall and zero pixels from the top wall for anything with the class of scoreboard. Oh, saving it also helps. And you see that should now make all of my scoreboard images line up in the same spot instead of, you know, waiting for one to be done before the next one shows. All right, let's get my logos down to the bottom. What are these? So these are each 240 by 140. I recommend doing that when you create your logos. Even if they're different size logos, make the overall image containing them uh, the same size for all of them so that it's a little easier to play with and move around. We're gonna want those, it, it's a small box, so we want them centered. So it's 240 pixels out of 1920. So it's a little early for me to do arithmetic, so we'll just do this the easy way. Minus 240 divided by two. In order to center it, you're gonna wanna put that at 840 from the left. Okay. 
see how that looks. All right, so they're a little low. Let's bring those up just a bit. Okay, now one thing I do always do and I recommend doing is uh, even though you're not necessarily covering important information here, unless this was, say, Dragon Ball, uh, where the Dragon Balls will occasionally appear here, um, I still just don't like the idea of taking away space from an active part of the screen that you don't need to. So we're going to set the opacity for these. Oh, my God. If I can type the word opacity. There we go. To just about 70%. There we go. That way, now with them all stop, stacked on top of each other, it's a little bit harder to tell, but when there's only one logo at a time, uh, it'll be a little bit uh, transparent so that you'll still be able to see what's happening in the game behind it. Um, I personally prefer always doing that during the scoreboard. You'll have a million other scenes to plug logos at full opacity. So I feel like that this is just kind of not the place to do it. All right, so now what else do we have? We gotta get these where they're supposed to go. Uh, now this is where, um, I know I've linked it before in the prior tutorial, I'll link it again when I get to the YouTube of this. I like Photo Filter for this. Um, it's just a freeware little Photoshop kind of knockoff that um, it's not as powerful as things, uh, as Photoshop in certain things, but there are a few things that it's super handy for to do quickly. So one of them is figuring out pixel positioning within an image. So what we're going to do here, let's open these. Just keep stacking these up as layers. All right, uh, so now we're gonna click the cursor and get our little box tool here. Uh, and then this just lets you draw a box the way you would in Photoshop. The main benefit to this one that I like is right down here. It tells you the top left corner of the box, so where it's positioned, and it gives you the width and the height. And it has that information displayed at all times, which Photoshop does not, and I have not yet figured out how to make it do that. Uh, and I'll show you why that's useful for setting up your CSS. So we're going to take from inside corner to inside corner. It's about 348 pixels by 45 pixels, you see. This is our space to put names in where it doesn't clip past the corner here and look weird, this is going to be the boundary of our text box. So let's come back here. What was it on? 348 pixels wide. 45 pixels tall. We're also going to set the line height here, which is a property that is uh, specifically for text. Um, this is how it knows how to center vertically. If you do not set a line height properly, it's usually going to just align to the top of your div. So this will center the text vertically. We also want to center the text horizontally. Um, now, depending on your overlays, you may, uh, how you want it to look, you may have one side centered to the left and one to the right and whatnot. But for this particular one, we'll just have them centered horizontally. Um, now we can see that the top, this is 30 pixels from the top, and these are both the same distance from the top. So overall in our wrappers class, we can say that to set 30 pixels from the top. 
And then for individual wrappers, Actually misspelled that, there we go. This is 456 from the left on the player one side. If I didn't mess up in Photoshop, this next one should be like 1,116-ish. Yep, okay. So player two, everything about the player two side, the dimensions are the same, it's just that from the left side, it is 1,116 pixels. Now we're going to do the same thing for the scores. All right. Usually scores, just to make things center easily where possible, I try to just make it a square and then center from there. Um, so... So 41 by 41. Whoops, come on hands. Sorry, it's a little bit early for typing right now. Again, we're going to set the line height so that things center vertically. And one thing we're going to do a little bit different, because this is a uh, lighter background that's going to have white text on it, we're going to actually just set a little bit of stroke on the text. So we're going to use the WebKit text stroke. This does not work in all browsers, but um, something I do want to kind of point out, uh, a, a mistake I've seen when I get overlay packages from other people sometimes is especially uh, people coming from a web design background instead of a streaming background. Um, again, I come from like an accounting background prior to this, so I didn't necessarily have the web design uh, ingrained in me. Um, they program it to be like a web page and they take things like security into account and, uh, you know, browser compatibility, uh, when in reality, all we need to do is the minimum amount possible to make it work in the, the one or two streaming applications that we're going to use. We don't have to worry about whether or not it works in, you know, Safari version one point, whatever. So things like using WebKit, which Exploit and OBS both support, perfectly fine. So one pixel, black. Um, while I'm thinking about it, we're also going to do teams. Change their text color to light gray, just so they stand out from the names a bit. So player one score, that is 402 from the left. Yeah, um, I now work in tech. I work in a data center currently uh, outside of the streaming. I do that as my day job, but um, I didn't have any tech experience really when I started streaming. And that's kind of why I'm doing this tutorial to show that if you spend a few weeks on like W3 schools, uh, looking up HTML and JavaScript. You can learn how to do all this. I'm not some sort of knowledgeable programmer. All right, so this is 1477 from the left. Is that right? Yeah, that's lined up, okay. And outside of the Adobe Creative Cloud suite, um, really that's the only thing that costs money that we're using here that I'm showing. So this is something that's pretty viable as a DIY for your locals. All right, so the scores are set. Let's get the round. Is that right? All right, so it's about 210 pixels.
36 pixels tall. Um, again, because this is something centered in the top, easy way to find out center positioning and to make sure it kind of lines up with what photo filter is telling you here. Apply by two. Whoa. So that would tell me that I'm actually a little bit off. Uh, basically, uh, I know how I mentioned in Photoshop, normally there's grid lines that appear that help me to correctly place things. I don't know why today. Uh, every time I did test runs for this, uh, all of yesterday, they were there. Uh, they were not this morning for some reason. So you can tell that I actually messed this up by like a pixel. It's slightly off center. Um, it won't be mega noticeable uh, for an example. I would go back and fix this if, if it was something for, you know, like an actual production event. Uh, but we'll go ahead and just center the text to the round box. Uh, kind of along those lines, something I actually want to point out in case you see something that looks a little weird. Um, something about Team Blue at Arxis, uh, both Blaze Blue and Blaze Blue Tag the UIs for that game are actually a little bit off center, like three to four pixels to one side. So sometimes you'll make your overlays and you know be a little confused as to why they don't seem like they're you know lining up quite right. Um, you know, graphic design people will notice it. General viewers, it's not that jarring that they'll probably notice. So it's usually something I let slide. All right, so. should have our positioning set. Let's see how that looks now. Okay, now we just gotta get our font sizes. Oh yeah, and here we forgot to set something to center this, both horizontally and vertically. There we go. All right, so we need to obviously increase the size of these fonts, so let's do that. Our names, depending on the size of your wrapper, I usually do somewhere between 28 and 32 pixels. I'm gonna go with 30 here. Our scores we're gonna make slightly bigger. And our round, we're going to make smaller because it's a smaller box. There we go. And everything nice and filled out. Uh, and while we're here, actually, I know I'd mentioned that this extra JavaScript area we made down here was to hold variables for later. So we're just going to go ahead and, while we're here and create a couple variables to hold those values that we just set for the names and the rounds. And I'll get into why we're doing that a little bit later. Okay. So our CSS is all set. So we can go ahead and start moving on to integrating stream control and animating this. So we'll do the stream control first. Going to go ahead and pull out our layout file and open the stream control here. First time you launch it, it's going to want you to specify a layout. Um, I also changed the output format to JSON. I uh, don't really need XML, and we're just going to be writing everything to read from the JSON. Uh, so there's not really good reason to do both. All right. So this is the default layout of Stream Control that FARP has in the package. So let's go ahead and edit this for the things that we need. So what do we need? We need, we have names and scores. We also are going to need teams. Um, we're going to need what round it is to fill out that round box at the top. And we're going to need something to set what game it is so that, as I mentioned, this should dynamically alter the scoreboard to fit whichever game is currently being played. Uh, so let's go ahead and just make some tweaks to this. 
Um, XML, out of everything you're going to be writing here, XML is definitely the easiest. You should be able to learn how to do this in just a couple of hours. Um, we're only going to do this first tab for now because we're only working on one scoreboard overlay. Uh, maybe I've done a couple of things for stuff like this already. I might go ahead, go ahead and follow back up with some of these with new ones later. But first, let's make this a little bigger here. This is the overall layout of stream control. We're going to make it a little bit taller to fit the things we need. All right, we're not going to use this here, so we're going to get rid of that. We're going to use that label still, though. Move it to the left by the other ones, to the third row. And we need to make one more for the game. We're going to get rid of that rounds drop down. And I, I make a few other minor changes, like uh, see how the scores here are a little bit smaller than the names. I'm going to increase the size of those vertically just to because that bothers me. So that's not not something important. There we go. Now it's the same size as everything else. Um, however, we want to put teams kind of in here. So if we need to move those buttons out of here, move those scores to the side. Also, something I want to show is if you hit tab, I'm a keyboard person. You know, I use tab and shift tab. Um, you can see the order here. It goes from player one to player two to score one to score two. Um, I personally like it so that you tap through all things for one player and then all things for the next player. So in order to do that, it actually tabs just in the order that the objects are placed here. So we're going to take player one score and move it under the name and keep the player two score under the player two name. Now you'll see it tabs in the order of everything for each player down. Uh, I'm going to adjust these names real quick just so they match what I typed in the uh, HTML, where I had P1 name instead of P name 1. What? Where are you going? Why did that go over there? There we go. Okay, P1 score. Change that to P2 score. Um, don't forget when you change these, you also need to edit them on your buttons. We'll get to that in a moment. Now we're going to add one to input our team. We don't need the team one to be crazy wide. It's only got to fit a handful of characters. So I'm going to shrink that down. I'm going to make that a little more even. Now we're going to adjust the positioning of the score around it. So this starts at 60, has a width of 130 or 170. So that's 230 total pixels. Um, I'm going to add 10 onto that so that uh, create a little space between them. So we're going to do completely forgot how to math. 60, 230 plus 10 is 240. There we go. And then same thing with the score. We're going to move the score. So 240 plus 60 is 300. Add 10. We want the score to start at 310. There we go. So let's go ahead and do that again for the player two side. Change the Y to be on the second row there on 40. Change the score. Let's move these buttons down just to get them out of the way for the moment. There we go. And everything tabs in order. Uh, something else you're going to want to do. Um, uh, yes, this this will all be archived. Uh, this will be archived both here, and I'll have it on YouTube by tomorrow. All right. So 
uh, you're going to want to tie these to CSV files that Stream Control will create so that you can autofill quickly when it's time to actually update a match. So that is done using Dataset. I'm going to call it players.csv. And the player names will be the first field in there. So data field will be one. Um, we're going to do the same thing for teams. That's going to be data field two. Now what you can also do here when you're using that is set a master, which will be player one name. Uh, so what that is going to do is tie the team to the name. So if you autofill the player one name, uh, name, player one name, and you hit enter, the player one team will also fill based on which one is in the field next to that name. Uh, of course, if you have duplicates of the same name, that'll kind of make it go goofy, but try to avoid doing that. Um, and one really nice thing about doing stuff like this is uh, if you have a bigger tournament, you can do something like export uh, the attendees.csv from smash.gg and then format that CSV to match this, how you would have this. So you, you cut it down so it's just player names in field one, their team in field two, uh, and you can basically auto-generate this giant list of autofill for stream control out of what you pull from Smash EG to save a bunch of time preparing for a tournament so you don't have to look up every name separately. Now let's go ahead and add somewhere to put our round. So we're going to need another line edit field. Now line edit is a text box. Uh, you'll see the types here. A spin box is where you rotate numbers to keep scores. And then there's buttons and also show a couple of other things here in a moment. So we're going to call this round, move this down to the third level. And we're going to have this autofill from its own CSV instead of from player names. All right, let's get these buttons cleaned up a little. Uh, right now, there's a swap to swap information between player one and player two. And there's a reset to clear the scores. We're going to also add a third button just to clear everything out. So first, the swap. Uh, you can see here that the swaps are in sets. So it says swap everything in swap set 1 with swap set 2. So the name, the team, and the score from player one. I'm going to go ahead and swap that with the same fields for player two. And then we're going to make one more reset button. Uh, something important when you're making buttons in stream control, you see how this one's called swap one? Uh, it is very important to give a different unique ID to every button. So we're going to do reset one and reset two. These buttons will just not work if there's two of the same ID. make these buttons a little wider just so they're kind of easier to hit. Now as a director um, I like having my stream control relatively small. I want it to take up the least amount of room on screen possible but I also don't want to be like missing buttons because my mouse speed is you know relatively high or whatever. Uh, so I'm going to make those buttons a little bit bigger.
All right, and we want this one to reset pretty much all of the match info. So all six of those fields, it's going to reset. All right, that's there. Now we just need something to choose our game. So we're going to use something called a combo box, which is basically a drop down, but you can also make it a text field. I'm going to call this game as the ID. Uh, there is a parameter on combo boxes called editable. We're going to use one. Uh, that is saying that while it is a drop down box, you can also type in your own value. All right, now you're going to see, though, that there's you can type here, but there's no options in the dropdown. So we need to add those. Those are called combo items. And all we're going to do here is put a shorthand version of each game. Now, I'm just including the things that I normally might stream at my local, so you can obviously add whatever you do normally stream here, uh, which would be... Now we have all of these games here to choose from on the dropdown. Uh, so let's just make sure all of our buttons work. All right. So, oh, forgot to set a score. One, two. So the swap works. Oop, forgot to change the name on this though. Let's call that clear so that it's less confusing. Okay, the swap works. The reset resets the scores correctly and the clear button clears all of that info out so you can type fresh ones in. So let's go ahead and give that a save. Now, I do want to point out when you're using these CSVs to hold autocomplete data, um, the very first time you go to save, if you're creating one here, um, when it creates that CSV, every now and then stream control might crash. Um, that is somewhat normal. Um, if it happens, just relaunch it. It'll run fine from that point on. It just, I don't know exactly what it is. It just kind of happens sometimes if you're creating new CSVs for the first time. But it looks like it didn't this time, so we're all good. So let's go ahead and check our output, which is our stream control.json. There we go. Our game is there. Player one name, score, team. Same for player two and the round. Those are all there. So it looks like everything uh, happens to be working normally. Um, yeah, I think that is specific to the point four, which is a beta version. So, you know, stuff happens. But like I said, it, ne it never happens like once you're, you've been using it. It just happens that first time sometimes that it creates a, a CSV. All right. So we have our stream control set. Now it's time to get to our actual JavaScript and start integrating stuff. So we're going to go ahead and uncomment these since it's going to be time to use them. 
We're also going to uncomment our video and comment out our image sources. Now I do want to say if for some reason you know you didn't have access to if Creative Cloud is like totally off the table, spend money on it for you. Um, you can do things like either use still images and then animate them with TweenMax, uh, which is how I used to do things, or you could also um, manually make each frame a separate PNG and then use something like FFmpeg to uh, convert the PNG sequence into a WebM. So you do have some options that aren't strictly Adobe. It's just, to me, the easiest workflow. All right. So give me a second. Let me pour a little more coffee here. All right, guess who totally just spilled all over their desk, but we're going to let that go for now. Moving on. So to start, we're going to make just one super, super basic bit of code in our JavaScript. So we're going to do a window.onload equals init, which we're saying that once the window once the browser recognizes that the window has loaded, run this function. Create this function, and this will be this function will basically hold all of our actionable JavaScript here. Okay, function scoreboard. So now we're going to go ahead and bring in our WebM. So we're going to use our dot attribute here, dot attr for jQuery. We're going to pick the source attribute, and we're going to set it to So what this is saying is take our ID of scoreboard vid, which is our video here, and set the source to be this WebM that we specified. This particular part where you play out the video is the only thing um, you're actually gonna that, that I use vanilla JavaScript for just because it's for some reason really wonky to like play a video in jQuery to me. Okay, so what this should do Let's go ahead and actually call. This 300 second timeout, um, all this does is to just barely delay the beginning of your load in animation for your scoreboard. And all that does is just to account for the amount of time it takes for the streaming application to actually change scenes so that the change is just a little bit less jarring All right, there you go. So it loads in, plays the video, and then the video sits. Uh, now, something else that I do want to point out is for XSplit specifically, there, there's probably something similar in OBS. I don't use it enough to know. But if you go to Tools, Settings, and this is, this is the premium version of XSplit. I apologize, I don't know what is locked behind the paywall for XSplit. I've never actually used the free version, so I'm not aware of what you do and don't have access to in it. But in the premium, you can go to Advanced Settings and Enable Developer Mode. So what this is going to do, if you come to your browser, you go to localhost colon 9222, this will just bring up a you know DOM and Element Inspector. So it'll pop up any errors. So you can see here, fail to load resource. 
Dean's Gate, Condensed, Dash Bold. Uh, let's see what's going on here. So, But if for some reason your JavaScript is like for sure just not working and you're not sure why, um, ah, here we go. So the <laughs> I want to point out actually how flexible CSS is. Um, you see the error that it gave that it could not find the file that I was uh, saying for a font. Um, it actually totally still worked just as CSS is a terrible language to learn in because it is very forgiving. It will let you make mistakes. So that should clear up that error that we just saw because now I'm referencing the actual file name. Uh, let's go ahead and reload this. Yeah, <laughs> okay, back on track. Um, we're gonna go ahead and our logos, we don't need for the time being, so we're just gonna go ahead and hide those for now. Uh, and while we're actually setting a display none, uh, we're gonna do that for this div too, this game hold that we made earlier, because this is actually supposed to be a hidden div that is just there to hold one piece of information that we do not want to ever be displayed. So we're just gonna go ahead and hide that. All right, so now that appears to be functional. So let's just start moving a step at a time and then coming back in and, you know, checking it every every couple steps just to make sure that everything's still working. So we're going to create some variables that we need. Uh, this stuff, again, this is kind of goes what I was talking about, about not necessarily wanting to approach this, even though it is a web page, you don't need to approach this from a web development perspective. Um, there's There's no security or access stuff going on, just... Uh, I set most variables I need as global variables right up top. You don't need to use best practices for everything. So we're going to do a new XML HTTP request. What this is for is to pull the uh, JSON file that we'll be reading from. Let's go ahead and also set a variable for that JSON file. We're going to make a variable uh, sc object, uh, which is basically just to hold the things that we pull from that JSON. So we're just going to create it for now. Uh, let's see. What else do we need? We need, uh, we're going to set this called startup, which is just to kind of set a, a, a yes, no flag on, is this the first time that the overlay is starting up or has it already run through the beginning process? And sort of along those same lines, we're gonna have animated, which is going to be, um, has the scoreboard been animated out yet? I'm gonna make a variable for our cache busting, which I'll get to later. variable for the game to hold that uh, field uh, that we created the dropdown for here. And there'll be a couple others, but I'll get to those when it's time. So first, for XHR, which is our XML HTTP request, we're gonna override MIME type to be application slash JSON. And all this is really doing, it should default just fine, but this is just sort of hard forcing it to always treat streamcontrol.json as a JSON file when it's decoding it. So we need to first pull our JSON uh, for changes, and then we need to parse our JSON to extract information from it. So first, let's pull our JSON. So we're going to use a little Ajax call here. 
our type is going to be get. Our target is going to be our stream JSON. We're going to add our cache busting here. Um, what this does is make it so that um, it's always technically pulling a different version of the JSON, so it doesn't run the risk of pulling a cached version with old information. Uh, now this method, this string query method of cache busting, again, if, if we were making a real website, not what I would recommend using, uh, but we're not making a real website. We just need something simple that works uh, without having to deal with path versioning or anything like that. So our target that it's going to be opening is our stream control.json here plus a little bit of a string query to add a variable onto it, and that variable is going to be our cache bus, which is currently zero. But then after we pull the information, we're going to just increment it up by one. So this means that every single time it goes to look for our JSON, it's saying, give me stream control.json with the variable of v equals zero. And then the next time it's gonna be v equals one. And for caching purposes, that makes it believe that it's pulling a different file every single time. So we're gonna go ahead and call our function and then set an interval. And we're going to run this. Uh, essentially, what I'm saying here is we're going to check for changes. We're going to open our JSON every 500 milliseconds, so twice per second. Um, you may, depending on the length of certain animations and things, you, you may need to bump that up a little just so it doesn't look for information while information is still in the process of being changed, things like that. Um, Usually somewhere in the 500 millisecond range is good. It's a nice mix of being responsive while also giving the overlay enough time to do its thing in between checking for changes. So our JSON polling function is now all set. Oh, yeah, real quick note. You probably notice when I am open tags, the second one pops up automatically. In Notepad++, if you go to Settings, Preferences, Auto completion, and you check these boxes here. Uh, when you open a type of tag, it will usually auto insert the closed one. Really helpful for not accidentally forgetting to close a tag. The two biggest causes of something not working, even though you wrote everything correctly, as far as you know, is either you forgot to close a tag or you forgot to put the colon at the end of a JavaScript line, or the semicolon, rather. Uh, that is usually going to be what happens every time. Oh, speaking of, I forgot a parameter here on the xhr.open. Um, we also need to put this true parameter. Um, this is a parameter for whether or not the uh, Ajax here is asynchronous, um, which that means that it is not waiting for everything else to happen in the overlay. It's going to just do this no matter what else is going on in the overlay at that given time. So this is important to heaven. All right, now we need to parse our info. So we're going to add an on ready state change equals parse JSON. And we're going to go ahead and create that function. So our variable that we created of our SC object, our stream control object, is going to be json.parse the response text of our XML HTTP request. So this is basically saying all of the response information that you got back from the stream control.json, we're going to load it into this variable here. We're also going to add in here, oh, you know what? I forgot something important. Apologies. 
this is only going to happen if the ready state of the XML HTTP request is 4. If you were to look at the ready state of a, an XML HTTP request, it's constantly fluctuating between a few different response codes, uh, with 4 being the one that it has successfully contacted what it was looking for and brought back the information. So this is only going to run when the ready state changes to something, but it changes to 4. When that happens, that's when it's going to go ahead and take the data that it just got and reload it into this variable. And we're also, because this is something that's running constantly, um, we're going to go ahead and set something that if this equals true, if the scoreboard has already been animated and we just pulled fresh information, we're going to go ahead and run this function again. So, Basically, once every half a second, it's opening the JSON. Once it confirms that it is ready, that the information has come back, it's going to update this variable. And then, if this isn't the first time it's doing that, then it's going to go ahead and run this function. And we will set something within this function to do what we need at the correct time. Now let's just take a quick second, go back to XSplit, make sure that video loads, which it does not, so we missed something. Uh, let's see what we got going on here. All right, something's unclosed. There we go. That's what we missed right there. All right. So the video still plays. All that is is because the video playing is basically the last thing. All that does is tell us that the code from here down is all currently working and we don't have to go into uh, debugging right now. So let's move on to the next thing. I'm going to go ahead and now that we have our information, we're going to assign our information from stream control to a few variables. So we're saying that the p1 name variable within what came back from the JSON, which if we go ahead and pop this in here, here, p1 name is player one. So we're going to go ahead and take that and place that into a local variable called p1 name. Uh, yes, uh, that animator will become set to true. I will be getting to that shortly here. Okay. Two. So this is pulling all of our main information. And now we're going to want to say that if startup is true, which it, for our purposes we're saying that if this is the first time that the overlay has loaded, We're going to change that variable we use to hold the game to 
SC object. Whoops, whoops, what am I doing here? And we are also going to now take that value that we just set and place it into that game hold div that we hid earlier. So what this is doing is in the background of the scoreboard here, somewhere you can't see, it's just creating a spot to hold the game that you set in stream control. And the reason we're doing that is one, it gives it something to look at to know which scoreboard to use, which we're gonna tell it to do in a bit. And two, if it changes, you have something that was stored to compare the new value to. Uh, excuse me, gotta get some coffee in me. Okay, and thanks for those of you who are tuning in this early. Um, I currently work the night shift. I start at 1 p.m., so I had to get the stream in uh, early, not knowing necessarily how many hours it would take and having to get it done before work, hence the 8.30 a.m. stream, which is a little early for me. All right, so let's just make sure everything's still working now that we're this far. That video's not playing, so what are we messing up here? Quick look at our debug. P1 name is undefined. Okay, so it's not actually pulling our variable properly uh, from the JSON. So we need to real quick have a look at what's going on there. Okay, that's typed correctly. On ready, state change is typed correctly. Last time this happened to me is because I had this part typed incorrectly, so we'll double check that. No, uh, line 24, yeah, that is. Uh, no, so when you're, when you're doing it, um, the generic JavaScript ones where it's using like the equal sign here, you can just call it like that. You don't actually need to. Uh, it's a little bit differently than just raw calling the function where you would need to use the little um, uh, parentheses here. Okay, so that still doesn't like that. Let's make sure we're not duplicating variables anywhere in here. I knew that something like this would happen where when I was running through kind of a test run to make sure I could do this relatively quickly, everything worked fine. There we go. This, I did it, in fact, miss a parenthesis. You were correct. I just missed it there. I was pulling my JSON. I was not sending it because I missed the parentheses there. So there we go. That wasn't too bad. And now things are playing again. Okay, we're in business. 
Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and set all of our information that we are pulling into our divs. Just do this all copy paste to make it a bit faster and more importantly to make it accurate to make sure that you're typing the same thing every time. Okay, so this should change all of the information in here to match what's in stream control. One way we'll be able to tell is to make sure things were centered earlier in the CSS. I had both of these scores set to two, but in stream control, it's actually set to one. All right, that did not do it. Let's see what we're missing. Nothing, apparently. Oh, <laughs> all right, I'm forgetting my basic jQuery. Forgot to add the ID marker in front of everything. Okay, that's just me being a little slow in the morning. There we go. So now we can see that change if we swap these things around. You can see that it updates. Notice that it is not updating if I do it live though. It doesn't update until I reload. So we're gonna get to that shortly. Um, what I would like to do first is get a little bit of animation going on on these. So we're going to go ahead and set all of these elements for the text to disappear for now. I'm also going to go ahead and just clear out our spaceholder text. So right now there should be nothing text-wise that shows. So now we're gonna use TweenMax. Uh, the nice part about TweenMax is it's just kind of uh, allows for smooth animations of things. So first thing we're gonna do is use TweenMax.set to set our player one name wrapper. Uh, we're gonna move it in to the center so that it animates like the scoreboard coming from the center out. Uh, usually I, I do about a, a quarter of the width of the name bar, maybe a little bit more as far as the offset. Now we're going to use tweenmax.2, which is going, there's tweenmax.set, which just sets whatever value you need directly. There's tweenmax.2, which will go to from whatever it's currently set to, to whatever you're specifying. And there is tweenmax.from, which will go from whatever you're specifying to whatever the default CSS is. So P1 wrapper, uh, we're gonna give this about a third of a second to load in. We're going to do CSS.
x. We're going to return our x to plus 0 pixels. What we're doing here is telling it that we're going to move the CSS plus 90 pixels on the x axis. So it's going to move 90 pixels to the right. Here, we're telling it that we want to move back to plus 0. Now, this plus 0 is relative to the left uh, value that we set here. So if we're doing it plus 90, this is going to temporarily change it to 546. And then when we set it back to plus 0, that's going to put it back to 456. And we're going to also set the opacity to 1. Um, we're going to add a little bit of easing here. This is just one of the default e uh, normal easings within TweenMax. That is one of the nice things for TweenMax over just moving things with jQuery that I, like I used to, uh, is that the built-in easing animations within TweenMax is just smoother. It's easier to work with. And we're going to set a delay of uh, about a third of a second to give the scoreboard time to run. Oops. Okay. I'm gonna make sure to close these. Close these correctly. There we go. Okay. So this should, if everything's done correctly, animate the player one name in. There we go. Uh, and you see here that that delay is maybe a little long. The the scoreboard comes all the way in, and then the name comes. So let's shorten that up just. A tiny bit, like 100 milliseconds. Something important to note is normal JavaScript in jQuery, the time values are always in milliseconds, where in TweenMax they're in whole seconds. So if you want 300 milliseconds, that needs to be 0.3. So OK, that looks a little bit better. Now, here is where I start getting to the part of making this flexible. So you can do different games or easily change assets out between events. So instead of just having these values here and here built into the scoreboard.js uh, template, we're going to actually store those in the scoreboard in this area that we set aside for variables. So I'm going to do variable for p1 move, which is going to be how far the player one wrapper is going to move. Now player two is going to be moving the opposite direction towards the inside. So it'll be the same value, but minus 90 pixels. Uh, we're going to go ahead and set the time for the animation. Going to go ahead and set the time for the delay which we had set to point 0.2. And now we're going to replace these with those variables. Whoops. So what this does is now let's say we change our animated scoreboard to something that takes longer to animate than what we currently have. This will allow us that all we have to do when the WebM changes is come back to our scoreboard.html, change these values. Let's say it is a longer scoreboard and you want to have more space covered. You just change this to a larger value. Um, let's say you want the animation to be slower to match the animation of the WebM you increase this value. Uh, if the animation for the WebM takes longer to complete before you want to show the names, you just increase the name delay here. That way, it's really easy to adjust when you change graphical assets instead of having to rewrite a bunch of stuff. You're just changing a couple variables. So let's go ahead, make this for the rest of our fields. And we also need to make one for the round. Now, remember that the round is going to be moving down from the top. So it'll be moving on the y-axis, not the x-axis. A 
let's go ahead and set those values too while we're here. So just gonna bring that up about 40 pixels. So that'll bring the text kind of up through the top and it'll appear as it moves down. Uh, for now, we'll go ahead and go with the same timings on the round. We'll see how that looks afterwards. See if it needs to be slower, faster, delayed a little bit more. Oh, yeah. That actually should be round size. Thanks for that catch, Anby. So these are, earlier, these are the uh, font sizes that we assigned to the name bars and the rounds. We'll get to why we're storing this here a little bit later. Okay, now remember when we look at our WebM, um, the name bars appear first and then the scores, the little pips appear from under them. So we're going to delay that just a little bit more on the scores to kind of match that animation. So let's go back to our JavaScript and we don't need to move the scores. They're just going to sit in place and they're just going to appear. So we don't have to do anything, any tween max dot set ahead of time. Okay. So we're going to do our P2 wrapper. It's going to be the same. We're going to do our round using our round time and our round delay. And we're going to do the scores. Um, for the scores, rather than referencing each individual scores, we can just do scores as a class because all we're changing is the opacity and they'll both come in at the same time. Okay, so let's see how that looks. All right, our round is missing. Oh, here we go. This is exactly what I was talking about for the round. Remember that is the Y axis, not the X axis. So we were not telling it to come down. There we go. Simple, but I think that looks pretty clean. The scores don't appear too early. The round drops in, timed relatively well with the top. So uh, I think for now that is pretty acceptable. Everything else is there. Team names are in a different color. Player names are there. Uh, so next, let's look at what happens um, when you have player with like an obnoxiously long name and it overflows your div and it makes you look stupid so let's see what we can do about that uh, this one I'm not gonna act like I made this up this was totally me just googling around for a while for different ways on how to resize font dynamically uh, it's kind of a pain in the ass but I got it working and it's very helpful so what we're gonna do is make a variable to reference each of our main text holding divs, which is going to be our round, our wrapper one, and our wrapper two. And this, by creating a variable uh, holding this, this will just make things much easier to type this next part. Otherwise, it'd be kind of a pain in the ass. So we need to do this after the HTML has been set so that it knows how, how much text it has in it. All right. So uh, give me a minute to remember how the hell this works. 
All right, so for each. Uh, this was the weirdest part when I learned how to do this. So this this I in this function, I'm going to be honest, I have no idea what it does. I know it does things iteratively during the while. Um, I don't know why it keeps the loop going. Uh, I do know that it doesn't work without it, even though it's not referenced anywhere. Uh, so it, it just kind of is... Uh, goes against my understanding of how while functions typically work. <laughs> but just uh, just use the code. It works. That That's how coding works is you find something that works and you copy and paste it and then you act like you're smart. So we're going to want to look at the scroll width and the scroll height, which is um, basically how much space the text is currently taking up and see if it's greater than the offset. So if the width is being overflowed or if the height is being overflown. So we're going to make a new font size. That font size is going to be, we're going to use parse float to break down the pixel setting of, because uh, normally, you know, the CSS value is like 30px, not 30. So we're going to use parse float to treat that as a number. So the wrapper. Dot CSS, looking at the font size, and use slice to just, this slice part I actually don't think is 100% necessary, um, but it's just to remove that PX. Okay. And... Okay, so let's look at what this is doing here. We're saying that we're going to take the font size, we're going to slice off the last two characters, which is going to remove the PX and leave us with a number. We're going to use parse float just to actually treat that as a number. And we're going to decrease it by 5%. And then when that is done and we have a new number, we're going to go ahead and slap the PX back onto it. So that leaves us with a smaller value with px at the end. And then I'm going to go into our jQuery.css. And we're going to change our font size to that new font size that we created. And because this is a while loop, it's basically going to just keep trying to do this until it finds a font size that stops overflowing the div. No, well, not quite. I messed part of it up. Let's see, make sure all my tags are closed. I know you're around here somewhere.
this is like almost always the part that I actually goof up when it comes time to type this stuff out. Uh, yes, the 0.95, the 5% decrease is sufficient. Um, I, I've tested it. You can make it like a 0.98 to make a, a finer control because what it is is it's constantly doing this until it finds uh, until it finds the size that actually fits. Alright, so in the interest of saving time, um, because I feel like I have this actually typed mostly correct, um, scroll width, offset width, scroll height, oh, hold on, ah, that should be offset height, so it should be scroll compared to offset in each one of those, there we go. Okay, so there you go. Now to answer the question about what if you have Daigo and his 72 sponsors in, and it's an absurdly long name, it's basically just going to keep doing it until it finds what fits. Okay, so that's working. So... Now we're going to just copy and paste this a couple times and adjust this for the other two wrappers that we're using it in. So we're going to do it in player two. And we also made one for the round. Okay, let's make sure this still works. All right, and now we're just going to go ahead and test this. Okay. There you go. You can see all three are working okay there. So I want to double check this. Ah, I did goof that up. Okay. Minor fix on, I noticed here that it set the name as the team. It was because here I forgot to set the player two team to read from data field two on the auto field instead of data field one. So let's just return everything back to normal real quick. Now our resizing works. So what does not work is changing uh, things while it's live, right? We have to reload every time. So let's go ahead and add what we need to make it change live. So you can see that all of this is saying to do this information while startup is true. I'm going to go ahead and remove all of this stuff here to um, another, um, another function. So we're going to go ahead and just cut this stuff out of the scoreboard. And the scoreboard is just going to be you know what, actually let's do it like this. We do want to keep this part. We're going to make a function called getData, which is 
actually pulling our data from stream control. Okay, so instead we're going to go ahead and set scoreboard to play our scoreboard and then call our get data function. If startup has already happened, we're going to have it just call the get data function without also running the scoreboard. Uh, now, in order to make sure that it knows to do that, we're going to here set startup equals false and we're also going to set animated to true so that it knows that the scoreboard has run whoops so in our get data function where we're pulling things from stream control we also want to separate what happens if it's the first time that it's running where it pulls all the information and it animates from what happens if this stuff has already happened and it's just sitting there live. Okay. So what we're going to have to do now is look for changes. So we're going to need to change. We need to pull new versions of the game. Um, you can see here it's constantly pulling new versions uh, of the rest. We don't want to pull the game again until after the scoreboard has played. So we're going to put that here. So first let's see what happens if the player one name changes. Uh, now, for comparis comparing the new updated variable against what's already in the HTML, we're not going to use .html. Oh, that looks weird. Uh, we're going to use .text, so it's looking at the text value contained in the div. Ah, I forgot it again text. There we go. It's not equal our variable p1 name, which it's updating up here from the stream control. Or if our p1 team is different. Just keep in mind that these are part of the same wrapper. p1 name and p1 team are essentially part of the same thing so if either of them changes we're going to want to update that that information okay so if player one name doesn't match what is being pulled from stream control or player one team doesn't match we're going to do some stuff here so first thing we're going to do is we're going to hide it we're going to take it off the screen Okay, so we're going to want to hide the whole wrapper. Usually I use about 300 milliseconds here. A 
going to go ahead and use the same variable that decides how much it's supposed to move beforehand so that it moves the same way off the screen. I'm going to set the opacity to zero. I'm going to set the easing before I forget. And this time we want the delay to be zero because as soon as it recognizes it's different, we want this to happen. Uh, now the wrinkle here is we're going to want it to do some stuff after it runs this tween max and hides all the, uh, and hides the name and everything. So we're going to do on complete. And when it completes, we're going to run it to run a function. Make sure all of our tags closed. So this closes our if tag. This closes our function that we just created. This closes our CSS here. And this closes our tween max. All right. So now it's hidden. So what we're going to want to do is update both the name and the team. Now we're going to bring it back. Going to give it a little bit of time just to change this information. I'm going to give it 200 milliseconds just to update these before it starts showing them again. Otherwise, it'll look really janky because you'll, you'll see it change names as it's animating back in. So you want to give it just a little bit of delay there. Okay, so let's see if this is working. Nope, totally goof something. That's closed. That's closed. That's closed. That's closed. That is. That is. Calling our function. That's there. So let's hit the debug real quick. See what it has to say. Uncaught syntax error. Line 117. Oh, forgot a comma right there. Thank you, debug. Oh, I missed two things. On the same line? Good Lord. All right. How about now? Are you happy? It's happy. Okay. Let's see if it changes now. Should just change the player one side. Animates it out. Animates it back in. All right. All right. So now what we need to do is remember that you can still add a stupidly long name after it's updated but it's only updating the name the first time. 
So let's give that a quick fix. All we're going to need to do here is basically just copy and paste this same blurb and put it after we set the HTMLs. Right, but we also now, when we change it back, it's still shrunk. So we need to do something to reset that font size. And that is why we stored these two variables here for the round box and for the name wrappers. Um, that way, when it's time to you know load up different assets and everything, um, all we have to do, instead of coming back and changing the default font size in the JavaScript here, we just alter this variable. So before it fills out the names, we're going to want it to take our p1 wrapper dot CSS. and set our font size back to our default that we set in that variable. And now, if the name that you change to does fit the div, it reverts back to its original size. So now we just need to remake this for player two and for the round. Not player three, what are you doing? All right, also player two team. Just the player two wrapper. Change this. Don't forget you have this P2 move here, so, or P1 move, so make sure to change that to player two. Uh, just have a quick look. Make sure everything matches the player two side. So we need to update this little function as well. Uh, now for the round, remember that there is only one round, so we don't need this or here. There's no sep second thing to compare. Um, we also don't need the second variable there. We're actually going to take out the move here for the round. We don't need to drag it back up off the screen. We'll just have it phase out to zero opacity and then come back in. So we'll make those two changes here. And we called this one RD resize, yes. Okay, let's try that out. So we're going to do a swap real quick, make sure things change. There you go. See the names both animate out cleanly. They change, they animate back in. The round will disappear and then come back. If you set it to something long, it'll shrink. And if you set it back to something normal size, it'll return to its original size that we set in the variable. Although, here. Um, so uh, you might notice that yes, this fits fine here. Uh, but what's going on is actually I accidentally set it to the same size as the names. And our resize function here just happened to catch it and put it back down to a normal size. So now 
this should set it back to the original size. There we go. Okay, so those things are all updating. Now we need to update the score. Nice thing about the score is we don't have to do any resizing or anything. Just a nice, simple fade it out, change it, fade it back in. So P1 score dot text. It's not equal P1 score. Same thing here. We're just going to go ahead and copy this function. Technically, we should have this here since it's inside of a single tween max line. We're never changing the score round or the score font size, so we can scrap that. We can scrap all this. So all we're doing is fading it out, changing the value, fading it back in. Relatively simple. Let's see if that works. Nope, missed something, whoops. If p1 score.txt does not equal p1 score, change, that's there, that's there, that's there. I think I forgot to close. No, I did not forget to close that. All right, we're going to go ahead and consult our debug for a second. Whoa. Line 164, something's going on a bunch. Oh, I mistyped it and it's being case sensitive. Let's try that. Now, how about now? Score disappears, score comes back in. That's working all good, so let's repeat that for the player two side. Okay. Now, we're getting pretty close. We have a functioning scoreboard, ties into stream control, everything updates, everything's animated. Uh, so we have a few things left to do. Uh, for one, let's go ahead and bring our logos back in. So we're going to set another variable here called logo time. Right now, we're just going to pick about half a second. Um, that lets us, if we want to delay when the logos uh, come in to kind of more match the animation of the scoreboard, that'll let us do that. So we're going to go ahead and use that variable here to set a function called logo loop that we're going to make now. Sure, we're clear of our other function. So we need to make a few variables here. I'm going to set the amount of time that, I'll oh, make that a little shorter. The amount of 
overall time it takes for the first logo to fade in from when it starts. We're going to set the interval in between logos uh, somewhere between, depending on how many you have, uh, somewhere between like 12, 15, 18 seconds. You don't want it to change often enough that it's distracting to the viewer, but you do want it to change often enough to get those sponsor logos in. All right, we're gonna have fade time. This is gonna be how long uh, it takes to fade between logos, like how long they crossfade each other. Somewhere between two to two and a half, three seconds is usually fine. We have a current item, which is going to be how it knows which logo it is currently looking at, which we're going to set to zero to start. Uh, we're going to have, uh, we need to know how many logos at any given time are there. So how we do this is we look at our logo wrapper here, and we want to find out how many things are contained in it. So we're looking at the children, the what's contained within that wrapper, dot length. So that's going to create just a number, basically, uh, a count of how many things are there. So that should come out as a three to tell us that there's three logos. So next, we need to, um, we're going to need to do two things. We're going to need to, if there's multiple logos, we want to rotate between them and we want that to adjust dynamically to include however many logos are in there, no matter how many are there. Uh, but we also don't want to do that fade in, fade out rotation if there's only one. So, if the item count is greater than one, if there's multiple logos in the HTML, First, we're going to, whoops, we're going to look for images. So we're going to look for uh, these HTML image tags contained within this logo wrapper. We're going to use .eq, which is uh, Java, uh, jQuery basically saying, look here. Um, sort of like uh, like designating a position in an array, but more for a container. Um, so that's going to be our current item. We're going to use fade in, which is just a normal jQuery function. And we're going to use that initial time that we set here. So what we're saying is to say find images within the logo wrapper, go to the images at position zero. Don't forget when you're using array type things, it starts at zero and counts up from zero. It doesn't start at one. So we're saying find image zero and then fade it in over the course of 700 milliseconds. Uh, something important to note that the fade in and fade out functions in jQuery, uh, they do not interact with opacity. They interact with display which is why we have display none here, because the fade in is going to change that from none to block, and then fade out will change it from block back to none. All right, so we faded in our first logo. Now, we're going to say that if our current item is at the max of our item count, minus one. Uh, the reason for the minus one is keep in mind that, that uh, item count is just a length. Uh, it is a value of how many children objects are inside the logo wrapper, which is going to be three, but the current item is going to be a zero based positioning. So the third child of item count is actually going to be at position two. So when we hit position two, 
we're going to go ahead and want to reset back to position 0. And if we are not at position 2 yet, we're going to want to keep iterating up to the next position. So we fade in position 0, and then we increase to position 1. I actually missed a part of this function that I'll go back and add in a moment. Okay. So after we fade in the first one, we're actually going to um, set interval. Going to create a function. Okay, sorry, I got myself mixed up for a sec. Just to go back over what I just changed. Um, we're gonna we're gonna make this function something that happens at a specific interval, which is gonna be our interval time here. And uh, you can go ahead and I know I mentioned wanting to have this as something that you set. Uh, you want to go back and adjust this scoreboard.js as uh, the least amount possible. You want to make your adjustments in the individual HTML files so it's easier to swap things out. So uh, you could also go ahead, because I use a pretty standard logo loop function across everything that I don't adjust much, I have these variables here, but you could also just take out these variables and put them here so that it's easier to adjust the timing of the rotation of the logos, uh, you know, based upon specific packages. So. We're going to use a fade out here. OK, so let's have a look at what this is doing. If there's multiple items, we're going to go ahead and find the first one. And we're going to fade it in. Then at a set interval, 15 seconds, we're going to find that first one again, and we're going to start fading it out over the course of two seconds. Then we're going to change which item we're looking at to either increase by one to move on to the next position, or if we're at the end, we're going to go ahead and go back to zero to the first position. And then that new item that we're looking at, we're going to go ahead and fade that in over that same two seconds. And we're just going to repeat this every 15 seconds unless there is only one logo. And what we're going to do if there's only one logo is, whoops, take the class of logos and fade it in on that same initial time variable. So let's see if this is operational. No, what did I miss? Oh, 
Here we go. Just the parentheses. Yep, and that there as well, too. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Now, a couple things we can change here. That seems to fade in a little bit late compared to the rest of the scoreboard. So let's go ahead and adjust that variable. I'm going to decrease that about 300 milliseconds. There we go. So that seems timed up a little bit better with the overlay. And then this should, after 15 seconds, rotate on to the second logo. There it is. We'll give it a second to make sure that it goes back to the first or to the third. Okay. And now one more, make sure it goes back to the end. Normally when I'm testing this, I actually set the interval to only be like two seconds just so I can make sure it's working and then I go back and change the interval to something longer. That way you don't have to sit for like a full minute to test. All right, that works. So let's see what happens if we start adjusting the number of logos. Okay, it moves on to the second logo. Now we've removed the third logo from the HTML, so it should be able to tell that there's now only two logos and go back to the first one after the second logo. And there you go. Now let's go ahead and whittle this down to just one logo, in which case it will fade that logo in and then it shouldn't try to rotate to anything. You would know if it was still doing it because it would kind of like flicker as it tries to fade into itself. It'd look a little goofy. Um, but should see at the 15 second mark, nothing really happens. It just kind of sits there. So seems like we're pretty good, right? All that seems like it's working. So we're pretty close to done. So. Uh, let's tackle probably this, this is pro honestly, probably this was my, my biggest win in coming up with new ways to code these overlays was trying to get away from like, uh, for combo breaker and frosties and CEO having to make 20 different scoreboards for different games. Um, you know, having a different file, making sure people use the correct one, uh, instead of just having, you know, there is no like one true scoreboard that looks nice on anything. You're going to need different specific assets to fit different games. But you can see here we're cutting off the health bars. That kind of looks dumb. Uh, so we're going to want to adjust that there. Meanwhile, you know, on other games, it's sitting really high up. There's a bunch of just kind of blank space. It looks a little weird there. So we're going to need to adjust for that too. Now we did already make those WebMs. Um, four different games. So let's go ahead and get those involved. I'm going to go back to our startup. Here, pulling the game, and we're setting that information to a hidden variable to hold it for later. We'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so we're going to say if the game equals one of the games that this particular WebM works for, we're going to use that. So that's going to be Street Fighter, Tekken, Blaze Blue Tag, and Undernight. All kind of have their health bars positioned in the same area. So if game equals BB Tag. Go ahead and copy this a little bit here to make this a little faster. Game equals Street Fighter V Arcade Edition, or if the game equals Tekken 
seven, or if the game equals under Knight ST. I believe that was it. From that group, yes. So if the game equals any of those games, I'm going to go ahead and set the scoreboard to be that WebM. So let's go ahead and refresh our scoreboard. Now, what is going on here uh, is me forgetting to close that tag. There we go. So the names pop out, but our game is currently set to Blaze Blue Central Fiction, so no scoreboard is happening. So let's change it to one of the games where this scoreboard actually works. We're going to try BB tag. There you go. Video plays. So now we're going to do an else if. What is all on our list? Most of what's remaining is going to need this scoreboard, so Dragon Ball, Guilty Gear, KOF, Marvel, and Marvel 3. Hi, Andrea Wu. I am making uh, an animated scoreboard overlay for fighting game competitions, like you would see streams for, such as Combo Breaker or Evo and whatnot, uh, so that people can kind of spruce up their streams of their local fighting game competitions. So now, for these games, we're going to want to use that second scoreboard that we made. So let's go ahead and set this back to BBCF. Okay, so it plays the other WebM that is higher up, but you'll notice our names and whatnot are out of place here. So we're going to need to adjust that. Um, part of the reason that we make all these individual wrappers, like this left wrapper and this right wrapper, is so that we can adjust these things pretty easily on the fly. Now, uh, if you were paying attention earlier, you might not have caught it. The difference in offset uh, between the Street Fighter 5.1 and the others, uh, the high one is 28 pixels up, while the low one for Street Fighter 4 was 24 pixels, or I'm sorry, not 24, 28 pixels up and down either direction. So we need to go ahead and adjust that. So we're going to use a tweenmax.set. Now the left wrapper, and the, instead of using the player wrappers, the left wrapper and the right wrapper also contain the scores so that we can move those at the same time. So we're going to set the y value. We're going to need it to come up. 28 pixels. We're going to repeat that for both sides. See how that looks. There you go. So all we did is pull up the container for the names and the scores, and now it sits where the actual scoreboard does. Now, uh, kind of what we did before on how we're making, we're holding our variables in the HTML rather than the JS file so that we can quickly adjust for different scoreboards, different assets, different games. We're going to go ahead and actually keep these values here too. 
So WebM uh, scoreboard 2 is going to be 28 pixels higher on the y-axis, while scoreboard 3 is going to add 28 pixels to go lower. So we're going to go ahead and put those values here. And just replace this value with the variable. There you go. Now for a game with a lower UI, like Street Fighter 4 or an NRS game or something, uh, we would go ahead and design a lower scoreboard. So it's going to be the same deal here. Except we're going to use the third WebM and the adjust3 variable. There we go. So now instead of making a scoreboard for every game, we just pick from our dropdown to the appropriate game. And it'll fit it, right? So mostly good. Uh, we just need to add a couple more things. Uh, for one, um, you'll notice I made this dropdown editable. Um, I learned this lesson at CEO where I had a list of official games, and I made a scoreboard for every game, and there was also a different scene where it included a text you know, description of the game that was being played. Uh, however, they ended up streaming some games on the official streams that were exhibitions or side games that I had not prepared for, and I had this as a hard-locked drop-down that they couldn't change. Uh, so I went ahead and made this an editable field uh, so that you can use this in other settings. You can like have the game logo tied to this. Let's say you also have a bracket overlay in the package. It can read from this value and queue up the correct game logo somewhere on the bracket, things like that. Uh, so you do want this field to be editable. However, you want to account for the fact that someone could type anything they want here. So we're also going to add an else Basically, if this is anything but any of these specified games, we're going to go ahead and use the scoreboard 2, just because that one sits at the top of the screen. And if you don't know what game you're doing, your best bet is to just put the scoreboards as, hard, as high as they can go for the most part and give as much game room possible here. You know, so that'll just give you a little bit of leeway. You may need to kind of adjust on the fly as needed, uh, but that's just kind of a, a little best practice there. All right. So uh, let's see how this looks for different games, right? Okay, so drag them all. Looks good. KOF. Looks good. BCI, all good there. Marvel 3, all good there. Tekken 7, remember that Tekken matches the Street Fighter one, so we'll change that value. Undernight, now the health bars match, but don't forget, Undernight has the grid meter. Very, very important resource meter for the game that you do not want to cover. And along those lines, uh, Blaze Blue Tag, while the health bars look good, um, Blaze Blue Tag has its meters, including the partner gauge, uh, the partner level gauge, towards the middle of the screen there. Uh, those are also very important 
So um, you do not want to cover those either. Uh, Trigun, yes, I actually have done some overlays with country flags. I did uh, Combo Breaker and CEO with them. Um, I'm not going to show that today just because there's a little bit more involved in it, but I will actually make uh, a short kind of addendum tutorial to show that off a little bit later. Um, but for now, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to do something about this logo while the game is set to either Under Night or Blaze Blue Tag. Um, now, usually what I do is I move it to this space in the bottom right corner instead. Uh, but you'll see that you also don't have a lot of room to work with over there. So we're going to go ahead and shrink down the logo a bit as well. So we're going to add a few more variables here. This time, though, we're going to make an array of variables because there's multiple points of information that need to be changed. We need to change the x value to move it horizontally. We're going to need to change the y value to move it down a little to get as much space as possible. We're going to need to shrink it. Um, so we're going to need to kind of pick a value uh, usually about 70, 80 percent. And we're also going to need to have a variable that marks what the original dimensions were so that we can return it back to the correct size when we need to. So we'll make an array of values here. So we'll try, uh, we're going to move it 850 pixels to the right. I'm going to move it like 40 pixels down. We'll adjust these if it doesn't look good. We'll just figure that out later. So we're going to do a 0.8 so that we can change it by a scale of 80%. We're going to do the original width, which is 240 pixels. And the original height, which is 140 pixels. All right, so let's go about adjusting this. We're going to make a new if, if the game equals BB tag, or if the game, whoa, stop typing in stream of consciousness. Holy crap. If it equals under night, we're going to take our Take our logos as a class. That way it just kind of catches them all together. Ah, I'm sorry. We're going to tween max that actually. Logos as a class. CSS. So we're going to change the X to adjust LG. The first position in the array was our adjustment for the X, our vertical adjustment was in position 1 in the array. So let's try those real quick. Okay, so we moved it over, um, but we do need to still resize it and then see how it looks when it's resized. So first, let's resize the width. There might be a more efficient way to do this than what I'm showing you. This is something I literally came up with like yesterday when I was prepping to do this stream. So I haven't had a whole lot of time to like make this the most efficient way possible. So we're gonna adjust the width first make a variable where that equals 
parse float b width what do I want here We're going to want to multiply that by our little adjustment factor that we hit there. So it's in the two position. Let me just look that over and make sure that looks correct. Oh, I think we actually want one of these around that. And then we'll close that here. Okay, and we're going to want to do the same thing for the height. So both of these we can adjust by the same factor. We're trying to decrease both down to 80% of the original. So now the width will become that variable we just made. And the height will become the other variable. Let's try that out. Yep, what did I do? Did I not close something here? Extra parentheses. Looks like that was the culprit. There we go. Okay. So you can see we shrunk it down a little bit. Uh, it's at a good spot in the bottom. We just need to kind of move that to the right. So let's go ahead and adjust that value. Let's move it bit more over. Okay, let's just let the other two logos play in real quick, kind of see how they look in position. Or I could be a dingus and forget that I had commented the other two logos out here. Let's try that again. Okay, so that looks a little bit low on the second logo since it's a little bit vertically bigger. But otherwise looks okay. So we're just gonna bring that up 10 pixels. All right. So now For streaming Street Fighter. Things look good for Street Fighter. Let's say we're doing Dragon Ball. Whoops, I forgot to hit save here. Dragon Ball looks good. We do an under night.
help bars are where they should be. Logos are out of the way. They're not covering any important meters. Say we play good games. We're going to stream Street Fighter 4. Okay, there we go. Those health bars match. So we're pretty close. Now all we need is, you know, what happens if we change games in the middle? Let's say, you know, you just swapped games. You kind of forgot that you're changing games. You forgot to hit the drop down. So now you're stuck with the wrong scoreboard for the game that you're playing. Um, and you want to change it in the middle of a match. And you want it to be not super janky, something where you're not obviously going in and, you know, swapping a file and resizing it in the middle of the stream. We want to do it cleanly. So we're going to go ahead and use that game hold HTML, that, that value that we've been storing for this. So after the initial startup, when we check our data, we've also been double checking that variable. So let's go ahead and use it. If game hold text does not equal the new game variable. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go ahead and hide pretty much everything that's on screen. Going to want a delay of zero because we want this to be a quick snappy fix. So we're going to hide the scoreboard background wrapper. Going to hide the scoreboard text wrapper. Going to hide the logos as a class. I believe that should be everything. So let's change games. Everything hides. So once it's hidden, again, this is where we want to bring out our on complete. And when it's complete, we're going to run a function that we will describe now. Now for this part, we're going to basically use all of this same blurb right here. Well, we're going to make a couple tweaks to it. Okay, so we're going to update the game hold variable, and then we're going to change to the appropriate WebM. However, we need to remember that we're changing from one game to another. So if we're going back to our standard scoreboard, we're going to need to use these adjustments and just set those back to zero. And along those same lines here, if the game is not blaze blue tag or under night, we're going to need to set the logo back to the original size. as well as the original positioning. So that's going to be 0. I don't think this plus sign actually matters. Just I do it just out of habit. I'm pretty sure if you just put 0 pixels there, it'll consider that as both plus 0 and minus 0. We 
don't even actually need to set variables here since we're not doing any math this time uh, because don't forget that we stored the original values for the width and height of the logos here. And then we're going to go ahead and play out the scoreboard just to get the new one in there. I honestly, I don't know if that play out is even needed. I'm pretty sure that if you, it'll consider the WebM already played and it'll just be sitting still on the last frame. This is just to make sure that the WebM plays through so that the scoreboard is fully populated uh, and it's not like hidden because the first frame of it is, you know, completely alpha out. So once we make all our adjustments there, we need to go ahead and bring this stuff back in. So we're going to set our opacity back to 1. Uh, I'm going to make the delay here a little bit longer. Keep in mind that the scoreboard is a half a second video. So I'm going to set the delay before things start coming back to half a second so that it lets it play out before they come back. Um, also, I want to note that this TweenMax setting the opacity back to 1 is not necessarily setting it back to 100% opacity. It's setting it back to 100% of the declared CSS value here. So how we're setting the logos to be 100, you know, 70% opacity. Um, this right here, when we set it back for the logos, is setting it back to 100% of that. So back to 70%. So if you set it here to 0.7, you're going to set it to 70% of 70%. And then every time you would make a change, you would kind of iteratively make your logo more and more... Uh, translucent. So just kind of keep an eye out for that. All right, so this should, if the game is different, hide everything, change the placeholder value to what the current game is, then adjust the WebM appropriately, and change the logo as needed. So let's give this a shot. Nope. I thought I ran through that a little quick to actually be correct. So we will give this a shot. Okay, that's fine. Time to hit the debugger. Oh, might actually be fine, and maybe I refresh the wrong thing. Let's see. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hit refresh on the wrong, <laughs> on one of the images and not on the scoreboard. Okay. So it's on BB tag, so that's where it should be. But we're playing Street Fighter 4. There you go. Maybe I was wrong about what I just said about the logos thing. Let's, uh, because that doesn't look very opaque to me. Let's try that with, could have been just because it was kind of a green background, so let's just find something that has a meter sitting there. Where's our good old undernight? Oh, I think you can disregard everything I just said about bringing the logos back to 100% opacity. I think you may, in fact, need to bring those back to 0.7. Let's give that a shot. Just change games a few times just to make sure they're not like totally dis 
disappearing further and further. Yeah, I think I was like 100% wrong about what I just told you. So just totally ignore all that. All right? Sound like a plan? All right, that's set for undernight. And I believe that is mostly everything. So let's just run through all of these games real quick and make sure it works. Did we get Guilty Gear in there? So we have Guilty Gear up. Let's try that. Check the initial load in. Everything looks good. Lines up with the health bars relatively well. Doesn't cover anything important. So let's check out Blaze Blue Tag. Looks good, logo's in the corner. It's not covering the Rachel specific meter over there. Undernight should be exactly the same. Let's just confirm that it's working. Aha. Uh -huh. So, something we just noticed right here. What happens if we change from blaze blue tag to undernight and we're decreasing the size of the, um, the logo, right? because it's set to take it 80% of the current value. So we'll just have to make a quick adjustment for that. Instead of taking the current value, we want to go ahead and take the original value Hopefully, this should be something we can just plug in like this. This is actually not something I had anticipated, so this one might actually take me couple seconds to get figured out correctly. Okay. There we go. That way, we're not just continuously shrinking our logo over and over. Um, so that is pretty much it. Um, everything appears to be working. Right? The swaps work. Can change this out. That works. It adjusts automatically for a really long name. It adjusts back when we go back to a normal size name. Does the same thing here. Goes back to the original size when we need it. Dynamically will update for different games. Uh, so I believe that accomplishes everything we wanted to do. Um, the only other little trick I'll add uh, before I wrap up, um, something that I personally do when I am uh, streaming events is for the scoreboard in particular. I'll actually go into my overlay folder here. I'll make a copy. Um, I want a copy of the identical exact same scoreboard. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and plus we're going to place that in a different scene. So now we have our two XML files. Now this is a file that XSplit generates. Uh, that just has some information for how these interact with XSplit. So come in, it has the name. Uh, let's just move to the right a bit, kind of get through all this stuff. I'm like, do you show the config 
menu when you pop it in, things like that. You can adjust certain things about the behavior within XSplit in here. Uh, you can also do that in the JavaScript if you download the xjs.js uh, file, but I'll go through that maybe in another day. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is adjust the value for refresh on scene load. For our main scoreboard, you can see this defaults to false. I'm going to change that to true. What this does is it forces it so that every time you change scenes and come back, no matter how quickly you do it, it's going to reload the uh, HTML file. Um, you might notice if you weren't doing this that if you uh, if you like change super fast, it'll actually still stay cached and it won't have enough time for the animation to reload. But if you go away for a couple seconds and then you come back, then it'll reload. Um, however, on the copy of the scoreboard, uh, I'm going to do, do it the opposite. I'm going to leave it as false, and then within XSplit, I'm going to go to the config, and I'm going to check this keep source and memory on the copied version. So the whole point of this is that the animation will always have been played. So if I come back here, it plays the animation, but if I come here, the animation's still where it was. Uh, the point of this is like, let's say something happens in the middle of the round and you have a player pop off um, and you want to quickly cut to that camera, right? But it's in the middle of the match and it's kind of weird to come back and roll out the animation as if it was a brand new match. Uh, and it makes the animations kind of like lose their novelty if you're just running them every single time you cut to the scene. So instead, I have that second one kept in memory so that I can cut to a camera and then cut back. Um, I kind of got the idea watching baseball. You'll notice that like when they do quick camera cuts, it's not like the scoreboard goes away. They, they'll cut to something and then they cut back, you know, and it just stays there. Uh, this is just a, kind of a way to make the presentation a little more normal. Cut to the camera and then you'll have this stay fully animated the entire time so you can just come back in quickly to the shot without having it reload the animation. So just kind of a little tip I give on streaming. Um, one other thing I want to check. This right here, um, you'll want to enable up to 60 frames per second. That can be, now this is something if I was using XSplit in particular, um, I don't normally have to check this box because I would be handling that with xjs.js. Um, again, I'll show that in another stream. Uh, but other than that, um, I guess while we're on that topic, let's just also make sure this all works in OBS. Where are we? New event, overlays, scoreboard. Okay, there is our overlay here. Just make sure that it all operates properly. Oops. Okay, the names change correctly. Scores change correctly. Logos rotating. Game changes correctly. Mm, that seems like a little cut off down there. Let's see if that looks like that in XSplit. Oh, so that returned back to the original size when... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, actually, that is correct. I shouldn't do that. Let's have a look at what's going on here real quick.
could have sworn that was working normally like just a second ago. <laughs> but let's just double check this. Okay, change it to a different game. Change it back to Blaze Blue Tag. Let's change it back to Undernight. Okay, everything's normal. Uh, all that happened here was on my, uh, I had an extra little uh, dollar sign and set of parentheses here that did not appear to need. Um, so when we make changes, whoops, replace our copy over here and refresh it. Uh, yes, the player names are in a CVS list. So let's, it's probably going to look a little goofy because of that part that I had wrong to begin with, but that's going to be housed in the SC folder. Um, I don't actually have Excel on here, but you can see in the layout, players will write to field one of player CSV. The team will write to field two next to it. So that'll tie them together. And then the rounds will write to round.csv. That way you have autofill on all of these fields. Uh, so that, I believe, is about it. Everything looks like it's up and running. Everything looks, let's just refresh this in OBS. Make sure that that looks like it's working normally there. So uh, if there's any questions, uh, you can hit me on Twitter. Um, I will have this on uh, YouTube fairly shortly, hopefully later today. Um, might take a little bit to actually get the video cut and uploaded and everything. Um, luckily, I didn't have like too much meandering around uh, trying to debug things like I did on a couple videos where I had to cut out like 40 minutes of me trying to find a missing semicolon. Uh, so that's it for now, guys. Um, I'll probably follow up with uh, some updated videos for things like the lower thirds, um, as well as maybe a couple other streaming tips um, when I can, uh, just because, as you can see, the coding style is a little bit differently than when I last did overlay tutorials. So I believe that's about it for me. Thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next time.